Hey everybody, it's Mike Sullivan. I'm gonna try something a little new today. I'm gonna title this video series, Morning Meditations with Mike, as we go through the Bible in a year, through our reading with Berean Bible Church. Every once in a while, if we hit some key passages, <clears throat> I would like to do some instructional videos and devotional videos um, on the passages when I have time. So let's go ahead and start. Hopefully you've been following um, the Berean Bible plan. Now there's a link right there. Go to Berean Bible Church. All right. Pastor Curtis, click on the studies icon. Then click on going through the Bible in a year and then do the one year plan. Okay. And so today, the 11th, we're in Isaiah 13 and 14, Psalm 106, verses 19 through 23, Proverbs 25, and 2 Corinthians 3. Obviously, I don't have time to read all of these to you, let alone teach every chapter. So I'm going to highlight Isaiah 13, Psalm 106, probably won't get to Proverbs 25, and spend a lot of time on 2 Corinthians 3, okay? So let's go ahead and jump right in. Our first passage is Isaiah 13. I hit this at the Arkansas conference. Um, so since I had some slides on it already, I'm going to just kind of refresh your memory. Let's look at what Isaiah 13 says. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged or it will not be delayed. Now, I'm going to throw this out here. If this is referring to the Medes judging Babylon, we're looking at roughly 170 to a couple hundred years. And so is that near? Is that soon? Would that not be delayed? Now, the futurist is going to come along and say, well, if soon can be 200 years, maybe soon can be 2,000 years. So I think as full preterists, we really need to take a look at this passage and develop it and see if there's something else going on here. Okay. So in order to do that, I want to look at other Old Testament passages to see what they say about near soon quickly will not be delayed ezekiel 7 verses 7 through 9 the time has come the day is near i will soon pour out my wrath then you will know that i am the lord who strikes john gill famous reformed baptist theologian points out this was fulfilled in three years when nebuchadnezzar came up against jerusalem in about 586 so near and soon is roughly five years or three years. Ezekiel 12, tell them therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb. What was the proverb? The false prophets were saying, they weren't denying that God was gonna come and judge them. What they were denying is, was the time frame. No, it's not gonna be near in our lifetimes. It's going to be near in the lifetimes of our generation. Wow, what awesome parents. <laughs> you know, talk about passing the buck. Oh, judgment's not going to come upon us and our generation. Oh, no, it's going to come upon our children's generation. So now near is being moved to a farther period. And that's what the false prophets were doing. And that's what false prophets are doing today. Of course, the office of prophet has completely stopped and ceased in AD 70 according to Daniel 9, 24. But we have false teachers claiming to be prophets today, and they are twisting eminence in the New Testament to their own destruction in many cases. Um, so we don't want to be guilty of this proverb that God is getting angry about, changing the meaning of soon and near to be something farther off than the contemporaries of Ezekiel and his audience. So let's go on. And they shall say no more. Use it use this proverb in Israel, but say to them, the days are near, Ezekiel. Say it's near. It's coming in their lifetime, in their generation, and the fulfillment of every vision. It will no longer be delayed. Matthew Poole points out that, again, 
This judgment was in three years, in their lifetimes, in their generation. Ezekiel 30 and Ezekiel 32. For the day is near. The day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds. Okay, so he's coming on the clouds. When I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. Matthew Poole again said that this is referring to a judgment that began in roughly three to five years, but extended to 16 to 18 years until its final fulfillment of Babylon judging Egypt and her allies, the nations of the then known world. Concerning the decreation of this, uh, the decreation language, he, he says this, I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Um, he says, the total ruin of the whole kingdom in which the best, greatest, and noblest parts are as heavens, suppose the government. So heavens is symbolic of the government of these nations. The sun, the king, the moon, the queen, the stars, the princes, and nobles, bright lights, the most eminent of the subject for wisdom and understanding, and then the land, the common people, all shall be covered with clouds and darkness of misery first, and sorrow next. So Matthew Poole is doing a great job here of showing that the time frame was literal eminence and the decreation language and God coming on the clouds is figurative language. So when we get into the New Testament, we want the scripture to interpret itself, use the analogy of faith, and therefore we don't need to change the meaning of eminence in the New Testament soon, quickly at hand, will not be delayed, is pointing to 8070, something that would take place in their generation and their lifetimes, okay? And the decreation language is referring, obviously, to the end of the old covenant world or the old covenant age and casting down the stars of the Pharisees, the civil and religious rulers in Matthew 24 and 23. So let's continue. Obadiah 115, for the day of the Lord is near. Upon all nations, as you have done, it shall be done. Oh, this must be the end of world history because it says all nations, right? Once again, Matthew Poole points out, there was truly an imminent judgment coming upon Edom and the surrounding local or nations of the world as they knew it at that time to be fulfilled within the lifetime of Nebuchadnezzar. Here again, near is roughly five years. Now, coming back to our text. Isaiah 13, verses 6, 10, and 22. Let's read it again. Well, for the day of the Lord is near as the destruction from the Almighty. It will come. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. Matthew 24, 29 following. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Again, Matthew 24, Joel, Joel 2, Acts 2. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged or it will not be delayed. So unfortunately, many think this prediction is referring to the fall of Babylon at the hands of the Medes because in that cha in this chapter, it does mention the Medes, but it also mentions Babylon. It mentions the Assyrians or the Chaldeans and it mentions the Medes. Okay. So we got to follow me. Okay. Um, but the truth is, this is referring to the judgment upon Babylon at the hands of Assyria some 15 years from Isaiah's prophetic word. Thus, the prophecy was literally near, and even a dispensational commentary points this out. Now, I'm going to be quoting from good old Dallas Theological Seminary, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, big old goofy thing there all right it's got some good things in there and it oh wait a second oh no i'm missing a slide okay there's my slide i've got something in between here all right um so let's go right there okay so after sargon the second died in 705 there was much rebellion in the assyrian empire the Amalites put Marduk over Babylon. He made an alliance with several nations, including the Medes. 
To subdue the rebellion in Babylon, Sennacherib marched there in 689 and destroyed it. All right. So he's basically pointing out we've got some archaeology. We've got some new material that shows that the the Chaldeans, the Assyrians came in and judged Babylon uh, to the degree uh, that's that's more in line with the description of Isaiah 13, okay? And even a hyper-literal commentary here is admitting that this took place in, in within 15 years. So now that better fits what we're seeing in the Old Testament pattern of what near and quickly and soon means. Now, here's a, here's a beefy book, all right? It's, uh, it's called The Burden of Babylon, A Study of Isaiah 13, verse 2, through chapter 14, verse 23, all right? And I got this because the Bible knowledge commentary is referring to it as its source for this really good discovery. Uh, I wish I knew this when I wrote House Divided and I, I had to deal with uh, the time text here in Isaiah 13 because 15 years fits perfectly and it fits the context. So let's go back because obviously my slides are a little messed up. Okay, so our second passage is Psalm 106, verses 19 through 23. Let's read it. At Horeb, they made a calf and worshipped an idol cast from metal. They exchanged their glorious God for an image of a bull which eats grass. Boy, that sounds a lot like Romans chapter 1. They forgot... That's key. They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. So he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him. Now, the book of Hebrews clearly says Moses was faithful over his house and he was a type of of a of a exodus all right event and now christ is faithful over his house and they're going through a second exodus where they're receiving and inheriting the rest that is the heavenly land and that would take place at christ in a very very little while and would not delay there's that would not delay all right of uh ezekiel and isaiah so that's all referring to AD 70. So Moses is a type, all right, of Christ who ushers in the second Exodus, which is the entire context of the Psalm of Psalm 106, which is just going over God's faithfulness in the Exodus. Now, I, I was meditating on this and I was thinking about how the church collectively, so we want to make some application here, how the church collectively has forgotten and misinterpreted and twisted scripture to where it's almost unrecognizable. God, Christ our Lord, descended from the heavens, came soon quickly and did not delay in AD 70 and saved his church to the uttermost, conquering the sin, the death, and the law. And the church doesn't recognize it. At least Israel kind of knew what God had done in the miracles and had heard from, from, from parents and so forth. But the church today has totally twisted what God's salvation plan is and has totally made it a hope delayed, which Proverbs 13, 12 says is a sick hope. It's, it's, it's ungodly, folks. Hope has been realized. It's a tree of life right now for us. And so we, as the church, we have got to get back and remember what Christ has accomplished. He has forgiven his people. He has put us in a world of righteousness. He has come like the son of righteousness with healing in his rays. And he has raised us. And we are like the son 
because we have his righteousness and we shine right now in the kingdom. We have received Christ's righteousness and that glory. And it's not a tissue issue. It's not flying off, off the planet, all right? It's, it's not some secret rapture or coming out of the graveyards. That's not what salvation is. And we've missed it and we need to get back to it so we can honor Christ. And then the second thing is, have you forgotten what God has done for you in your life? Is there a trial that you are going through right now that is similar to something you've gone through in the past and you're fretting over it? You're not casting your cares upon him because he cares for you. And you're not asking the brethren to bear your burden. You're being an island unto yourself and you need to be ministered to. You need to get on your face. You need to think of God's faithfulness. Look, what does Hebrew say? It says, um, one must believe that God is. You have to acknowledge that he is God, right? You must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Are you diligently seeking him? Because that's key. I, I, I don't think that the author threw in diligently, haphazardly. We have, I'm not saying you have to fast you know, for three or four days or anything like that. But are you diligently praying in faith? And when your heart is overwhelmed, as the psalmist says, when my heart is overwhelmed, God, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, Lord, increase my faith. I have faith, but it's so small. Will you increase it so that you might be pleased? Without faith, it's impossible to please God, the passage says, cry out him, cry out to him today and ask him to increase your faith. Remember his faithfulness in the past. Remember his faithfulness to Israel that she forgot. And then thank him for the second exodus that he has performed for the church. He saved us, not from the bondage of Egypt, but from the bondage of sin and death that came through Adam. Praise God. Now, when you begin meditating on that, your problems don't seem to be that big, do they? And when you realize what he has done for you in the past, financial problems, whatever, it encourages you and it strengthens you. And then our third application here, as Moses is kind of a type of bridging the gap as a mediator between Israel and God's wrath, we have Christ our mediator who intercedes for his people and has saved us to the uttermost. Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail and it didn't. And that's why Peter wrote in Peter, we are kept by the power of God through faith. He's the author, he's the finisher and he will strengthen you. All right, second Corinthians chapter three. I'm going to read from the Young's literal, which is always kind of brutal, <laughs> brutal reading, but there's a reason why I am, okay, in this particular passage. Do we begin again to recommend ourselves, except we need as some letters of recommendation unto you or from you? Our letter, yea, are having been written in our hearts, known and read by all men, manifested that ye are a letter of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in the tablets of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. And such trust we have through the Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter doth kill, so we have death going on with the old covenant, and the spirit doth make alive. So we have death and we have resurrection, we have life being described with the glories of the two covenants. All right, keep that in mind. Uh, 
And if the ministration of death in letters engraved in stones came in glory, so that the sons of Israel were not able to look steadfastly to the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, which was, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate because Young's Literal gets this right everywhere else as we go through this. But was is not a good translation here. I looked up my interlinear and a, a true literal translation here is which is being made useless. In other words, the old covenant glory that faded away upon Moses is still a glory that's that's characterized through the old covenant up until Paul's day. And it was it is being made useless from Moses even up to Paul's day. Okay. Well, administration of spirit, not more glory. Boy, that's cutting off. For the for the ministration of con, of the condemnation is now he gets it right there is for also even that which hath been glorious hath not been glorious in this respect because of the superior glory for if here it is for if that which is being made useless is through glory much more that which is remaining is in glory notice the present tenses here is and being i'm gonna take you through corinthians and and uh, go through this already and not yet because i have another video i'm gonna respond to doug wilson on revelation 10 and 11 uh, on the already not yet since he really messed that up verse 12 having then such hope we use much freedom of speech and are as moses who was putting a veil upon his own face for the sons of Israel, not steadfastly to look to the end of that, which here it is, is being made useless. The old covenant glory is being made useless, but their minds were hardened for unto this day, the same veil at the reading of the old covenant. Again, we're bringing it up to their day. That old covenant glory that was fading started with Moses, but it's coming up until even Paul's day. Which is, which in Christ is being made useless, but till today when Moses is read, a veil upon their hearts doth lie. And whenever they may turn unto the Lord, the veil is taken away. And the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all with unveiled face, the glory of the Lord beholding, present tense, in a mirror to the same image are being transformed from old covenant glory to new covenant glory. All right. So my slide got cut off. I'll have to fix that. So let's go ahead. Since 2 Corinthians is our passage Let's look at the present tense. Let's look at how Paul understood the already and the not yet. We're being told by Doug Wilson and so many, um, well, the all millennials would say the already and not yet is, well, the already is the, inaug the, the crucifixion of Christ, his resurrection, his ascension, the inauguration of the kingdom at Pentecost, and the not yet is when Christ comes at the second coming event to end the age, raise the dead, usher in the new creation. Well, then you have partial preterists like Doug Wilson, Ken Gentry, who are very, very, very confused about this already. They have invented their own version of the already, not yet. You know what it is? It's AD 30, already, inauguration of the kingdom, not yet AD 70, but the not yet is kind of another already and then we have another not yet at another coming of Christ. See how they've totally twisted it and destroyed it? There's an interaction with uh, uh, Wilson and an all millennials that I'm going to make a video on uh, today and just show how the church is just utterly confused and how partial preterists are totally fudging on the already and not yet. There's one appointed end to the not yet, all right? And it was imminent. There's not two not yets. There's not two already. There's not an already and an already and a not yet. There's an already 
and an imminent not yet, period, full stop, mic drop, okay? So let's go over this. Second Corinthians 3, we have a spiritual already and not yet taking that's in the process. The old covenant glory was passing away while the new covenant glory was increasing. They were looking at the form of God as in a mirror and being transformed. Notice that it's not a biological, it's not a tissue issue. They're not physically being transformed. This is a covenantal transformation that's taking place. They're being transformed into the image of Christ. Old covenant glory would pass in AD 70 versus the new covenant glory would remain and thus mature in AD 70 and in the new covenant age that has no end. Now, let's go into 1 Corinthians. Let's go back, all right, and see if we can find Paul's original already and not yet process and see if it harmonizes with the context here of 2 Corinthians 3. We have a spiritual already not yet process as well. There was a spiritual process taking place. They were being saved, verses 18 through 20. So the Corinthians were in the process of being saved. I wonder if that has anything to do with the old covenant veil being lifted off and the old covenant glory passing away and their salvation being this process where they're being transformed into the image of Christ. Yes, that's the salvation. That's how they were being saved. But we have the gifts such as tongues, prophecy, and the miraculous gift of knowledge we're in the process of confirming the early church until, time statement, the day of the Lord or until the end of the old covenant age, not the end of world history, when the church would become blameless. Now, that's a wedding term, folks. And when we see wedding term, we see resurrection. Partial preterists tell us that God divorced Old Covenant Jerusalem in AD 70, judged her, put her to death, and married, consummated his betrothal to the church in AD 70. Now, Doug Wilson sees the power of that. So Doug Wilson has is now trying to say that, well, that we're still in the betrothal period. We're not blameless. At least he gets that if the church has been married to Christ and we're in the wedding feast, then that means the consummation has taken place and we've been raised from the dead. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. That is when we are on Mount Zion, partaking of the wedding feast. That is when the death is swallowed up. That's 1 Corinthians 15, okay? And we'll get there. So here we have the gifts being confirmed until the day of the Lord, the second coming, to end the old covenant age, then the church was in the process of being saved. Now she would be saved. She'd be blameless. That salvation, she would have the righteousness of Christ, beholding her Lord and God face to face. But let's go on. What about 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and the already and not yet of 1 Corinthians 13? A, the old covenant glory was passing away while the new covenant glory was increasing. Well, what do we have in 1 Corinthians 13? We have the process of a boy growing into a man and becoming a man. That's a process. Galatians, Galatians tells us that the old covenant law served as a tutor to mature the church. And then she would move from faith to faith. She would move from the old covenant system of faith to the new covenant system of faith. They were looking at B. They were looking at the form of God as in a mirror, and they were being transformed into the, into the image of Christ. They're being saved. B, on the other side, 1 Corinthians 13, they were looking into a mirror. Let's let Paul interpret himself. What does it mean to be looking into the mirror? Well, Paul's already told us. He's already told us, and he tells us again in 2 Corinthians. It's a non-biological, a covenantal scene of God in the word of God. They're being transformed. The scriptures are being fulfilled. All right. And it's not an enigma, or it was because it was a mystery. The Jew Gentile 
union was a mystery that needed to be unfolded as the Old Testament scriptures were being fulfilled in Christ, not in the land, something different. Daniel chapter two, this is a different kingdom, guys. Not like the previous kingdoms, not like the old covenant kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. It will be within you. You're not going to be able to say, see here, see there, for the kingdom of God will be within you. So this is a scene of God in a mirror that is not biological, just like them being transformed into the image of Christ was not biological. So why do we have the imminent, not yet in AD 70, perverted and twisted by all millennialists where they twist imminence and they twist the nature of fulfillment or futurist in the par partial preterist realm who again are twisting the nature of fulfillment and inventing another not yet so they can keep their creedal jobs and not be brought up on charges right mr wilson i know you don't like that with the justification issue i guess you skirted that one but boy you wouldn't want to be blackballed at all for actually teaching the truth about the already and not yet now would you all right getting fired up and then number two the old covenant glory would pass versus the new covenant glory would remain well what do we have in first corinthians 13 we have prophecy tongues and the gift of knowledge would pass versus love hope and faith that would remain so we have things in the new covenant remember jesus said heaven and earth will pass away the temple the old covenant system that world will pass away matthew 24 35 but my words the words of the new covenant will never pass away they're going to remain and yet we have power evangelism i grew up in calvary chapel and the vineyard movement people are running around trying to perform miracles just making themselves look like idiots because these gifts ceased in AD 70 at the second coming of Christ when the new creation arrived. These gifts are gone. And the knowledge here is referring to a miraculous gift of knowledge like James had in what Acts 15 when he when he said, well, the coming in of the Gentiles, this is the fulfillment of what Amos 9 the, the broken down tabernacle of David is being rebuilt with the Gentiles coming in. Now, you wouldn't have known that, probably. You well, might not have made that connection, but he had the gift of knowledge. It was a miraculous gift. It was a revelatory gift for the church. This isn't talking about knowledge of computers or airplanes or any of that. You take that out of the, its context if you do. Then how are we to apply 2 Corinthians with 1 Corinthians 15? Again, we have an already and not yet process. The old covenant glory, the law, remember the administration of death written on tablets, it kills. That's what it does. It magnifies, it tells you that you're a sinner. That's what it did, all right? It was passing away while the new covenant glory was increasing. Look on the other side. There was a spiritual process taking place. They were being saved. 1 Corinthians 15 says they were being saved just like 2 Corinthians says they were being saved. They were looking at the form of God as in a mirror and being transformed into the image of Christ. Um, death was being destroyed and abolished. Look at the Weiss New Testament of verse 26. The present passive indicative here is powerful. It destroys all futurism. It destroys your immortal body at death view or your secret rapture baloney because this is not referring to biological death. It is saying that death is going to be overcome at the parousia, not at the point you die post AD 70 over and over and over again. No, you will be changed at the parousia. That's when the bodily resurrection takes place. It's not talking about individual bodies dying after AD 70, getting individual spiritual bodies. They always got a spiritual body. Samuel got a spiritual body, even in the Old Testament. This is not the point of 1 Corinthians 15. All right. Then he says, uh, the old covenant glory would pass away in AD 70. Again, the new covenant glory would remain and thus be matured in the new covenant age. 
Then we have this seed body of the church. And he says it's being raised in power. It is being sown a natural body in the ground, but it's still alive. And when it gets into the ground, you have this dying and rising process concurrently taking place. Do we bury people alive? No, this is not referring to individual bodies. This is talking about the church being in Adam and under the Mosaic body, going into the ground, being sown and coming up, being in the body of Christ, perfectly glorious, perfectly now separated. And the death that came through Adam in that body that was magnified through the body of Moses no longer has power over us because we're a different body. We're a spiritual body. We're a glorified body, not a body of national Israel that could be crushed by the Romans, could be crushed by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, Egypt, etc. No, this is a glorious body. It's a glorious kingdom that enjoys God's presence here and now and will forever be. Then you got, uh, I've added some in here just for fun. Uh, now you could do this for fun, all right? First Corinthians, just first Corinthians. So you have the gifts in chapter one, gifts such as tongues, prophecy, and knowledge, just like you have in first Corinthians 13. Two, they would be confirming, these gifts would be confirming the church until the day of the Lord or until the end of the old covenant age. Two over here on the other side would be, the gifts would be practiced until that which is perfect would come, which is what? The second coming and arrival of the new creation. Number three, there was a spiritual process taking place. They were being saved. First Corinthians 1. Well, First Corinthians 13. There was a spiritual process taking place. A boy was growing into a man. And they were in the process of looking at God's face in an mirror, in an enigma, trying to figure out this mystery. But in AD 70, that mystery was complete. The church is now glorified and there is no debate over that. Number four, the gifts end at the coming of the Lord. This makes the church blameless. Remember, that's wedding, that's resurrection language. Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, the gifts cease at that which is perfect. Again, seeing God's face at the second coming. In Revelation 22, verses 4 through 7, at Christ's soon coming, we are entering in to the new creation where we behold God's face right now. That's the not yet of the 1 Corinthians already and in the process of becoming in the process of looking revelation 22 is the imminent not yet doug wilson you're either in the new jerusalem now beholding god's face and the death is no more for you doug wilson or it's not stop being deceptive stop playing these games with the already not yet so you can keep your creedal job stop it it's deceptive and it's wrong, and you're forgetting what God has done for his church in AD 70 by making up another all already and not yet, and I'm going to expose it in the, my next video. I'm fired up, and then 1 Corinthians 13 with 1 Corinthians 15. Again, already and not yet process. A boy was growing into a man, or they would be looking into a dim mirror at God's face. Then they were being saved. Death was being abolished, the seed body was being sown and it was being raised. They would see God face to face at that which is perfect. And they would inherit immortality, eternal life at Christ's parousia. These are all perfect already and not yet. And the not yet was something imminent in AD 70. Not two not yets. Paul said, we, we, some of us were going to witness the coming of Christ and we're going to be changed. He didn't say some future generation. He believed Christ's second coming was going to take place in his lifetime, in his generation, and he was an inspired apostle. That's why he said, we shall not all taste death. We shall not all die, but we will be changed covenantally, not biologically. And so that's pretty much our study today. 
if you feel led to support me in in writing devotionals or doing devotional videos like this instructional videos helping me with writing projects i'm writing a book on deuteronomy 32 the song of moses i'm in chapter three right now um if you want to help me you know to do podcasts like this this takes a lot of time to do and you know please my patreon is up here uh, patreon.com slash mike j sullivan apparently there's a lot of mike sullivan so i had to throw in the middle initial there mike j sullivan or you can go to my website fullpreterism.com and hit the donate button um i'm kind of in a crisis at this point in my life i'm uh almost 57 and i've been wanting to do this full time or even part time uh but uh, it's i've got to figure this out guys i, I I either need to get support. A workman is worthy of his wages. Uh, someone has told me that I, I really need to, to point that out. And I, I love doing this. I would do this for free constantly. And I have for over 30 years. I've done everything free, all the charts, all the videos, everything, because I love doing it. I can't do anything else. That's my struggle. I can't get this stuff out of my head. It's and I'm a kind of all or nothing kind of guy. It's like, it's really hard for me to be at work when I'm doing podcasts in my head and I'm debating someone or I'm writing an article or I'm preparing for a conference or I'm preparing for a podcast or I'm writing a book, right? That's what I want to do. That's what I feel God has put me on this earth to do. And uh, it's, I need help. I need help. Some of these guys, these younger guys are pastors. They've got like four or five guys in their church that know how to edit videos, that know how to do all this stuff. And they have time to do this stuff. I need help. I'm trying to get to the point, if I can get at some point $500 a week, I need about 1100 to pay our bills, all right, a week, just being honest with you. So if I can get half of that, I can at least get a part-time job and make up the difference. And I could produce so much more, so many more videos and, and books and articles, podcasts. And I, that's, that's my heart's desire. If it's, if you're benefiting from my teaching, my articles, conference lectures, please consider being a regular Patreon uh, supporter of mine. I just put this page up. Please be patient with me. I'm learning how to add things to the Patreon I guess there's like three different tier levels of support. And um, so I need to add the charts. I need to add videos and I'm learning how to do all this stuff. Again, I don't have a church full of people that know how to do all this stuff. And I'm not some young buck either. So I've got to spend time, spent like three hours yesterday trying to learn how to do a thumbnail for a YouTube video. And I still don't know how to do it. You know, and then finding videos of people I want to respond to and how to clip the videos to just, you know, the, the, the little sound bite that I want to address and then upload it here. Sounds real easy, but it's not. I spent four hours trying to do that. So um, I just need some financial help and I might need some technical help. So if you're out there and you want to help me in that way, uh, feel free to reach out. All right, guys, Lord bless you. Remember. So what were our passages? Isaiah 13, time texts are literal, decreation, symbolic language. The church has completely flipped that upside down, all right, where they spiritualize the time text and literalize the decreation language as something made up in the future, supposedly the end of world history, all right? Uh, Psalm 106, they forgot the salvation of the Lord. The church has forgotten the salvation of the Lord, what he did in AD 70, because they flipped everything upside down. They spiritualized the time text, literalized the apocalyptic language. So we need to educate the church. That's what this is about. This is a reformation in the area of eschatology. And that's why I want to be supported because this is what I want to do all the time. And, uh, so anyway, I don't want to harp on that, but don't forget what God has done in AD 70 for the church, for you personally, and think about all that he's done in your life.
all the blessings you have in your family, your job, all the things he has blessed you with. Meditate on those and you'll find yourself getting out of that depression, getting out of that anxiety. That is key. The psalmist always does that. He starts off, oh God, why, are, why aren't you listening to me? You know, he's, he's, he's arguing, he's debating with God. He's, he's sharing his frustrations, his anger, his anxiety, his burdens. And then as he goes through, oh, but I remember what you've done and and then at the end of the psalm, most of the time, he's like, why are you cast down, O oh soul? Hope in God, for I will yet trust him. So trust him today. Watch him do great things. And as the psalmist said, then I will look up. What does that mean? I prayed. Now I'm going to look up and expect an answer from God. That's the kind of faith that we need. And I'm praying for you today. Lord bless you guys. Thank you.